People of God, this is the Holy Gospel for you according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus saw the clouds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak. And he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Praise to you, o Christ. Please have Grace to you and peace from God the Creator, from Jesus the Redeemer, from the Holy Spirit who blesses us and guides us always. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. So who here has heard of the butterfly effect? Anyone? Anyone? Oh, quite a few. You know what that is? I know there was a movie some years ago with that name, the butterfly effect. And in the movie, Ashton Kutcher plays a young man who has the ability to travel back in time. And he does that several times. And every time he goes back, he tries to fix something that that didn't work right or that he had done wrong only to find that when he makes the tiniest change in the past, the consequences in later years can be huge and devastating. This 2004 sci-fi thriller, fantasy as it is, is actually based on an actual scientific theory called the butterfly effect. It's seen in the 1960s, a meteorology professor at MIT by the name of Edward Lawrence ran some computer simulations to forecast the weather some months out. And he discovered that by altering the variables by the tiniest bits, the forecast would produce vastly different results. This unexpected finding led Lawrence to a powerful insight about the way nature works. Small changes can have large consequences. That became really important later on in what they call chaos theory. This idea, though, came to be known as the butterfly effect after Lawrence suggested that the the flap of a butterfly's wing somewhere in Tokyo might ultimately cause a tornado somewhere in Kansas. (laughs) This butterfly effect is also known as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. I just love science lingo, don't you? It has a profound corollary. Forecasting the future can be nearly impossible. I know this is a bit of a detour, but I wanted to tell you this story, but I was so intrigued to learn this last week during my research for this sermon. It's about the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria and his wife Sophie in 1914. And this is a prime example of what this butterfly effect is. You see, Franz Ferdinand was the presumed heir to the Habsburg throne, and he and his wife were visiting Sarajevo Sarajevo in Bosnia when they were shot point blank by a Serbian nationalist. There had been an assassination attempt early that morning. This is the morning of June 28, 1914. A bomb had been thrown at the motorcade, but missed the royal couple. Because of that, police decided that they would continue the motorcade on a faster, presumably safer route along some highway, but the driver of the royal car somehow didn't get that message, and he missed the turn that he was supposed to make, 
And that meant that he was delivering Franz Ferdinand and his wife right into the hands of the assassin who was waiting along the original route. The small mistake that that tribal makes, that one wrong turn, had huge consequences. Because the assassination of that royal couple, you will remember this from your high school history class, was the cause for the outbreak of World War I. A small mistake had dramatic consequences for an entire world, the butterfly effect. Now, you could argue that it didn't quite stop there and that the butterfly effect had one more step because had World War I not happened, and had the victors of that war not crippled the German economy through punitive sanctions the way they did, maybe the German people in the 20s and 30s wouldn't have turned to their strongman, Adolf Hitler, and World War II might not have happened either. One day, 2,000 years ago, a young man climbed a small mountain. With him were a group of disciples whom he had just called into this inner circle. Crowds were following him, following him around as his fame was spreading, but he took just the disciples with him that he had just called. There were four of them. We, we read that last week, and he began to teach. What he said in this Sermon on the Mount was revolutionary. There is no better word for it. And those teachings created their own butterfly effect because they, they were an act that in time would change the whole world. Now, I know you were wondering how I was going to get from World War I and the assassination in 1914 to the gospel for today, right? Well, here we are. <laughs> See, the story, the story that we hear today in Matthew's narrative is the story of Jesus' first teaching. We are in chapter 4 of Matthew now, and up until now, everything we've read in the previous three chapters is preparation. There's Jesus' genealogy, the preaching of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus, the temptation in the desert, the calling of the first four disciples, all preparation for what is to come. An overture, if you want, an elaborate introduction to get us ready for the main event. And now finally today, in this gospel lesson for Matthew today, finally we see Jesus in a pose that he will strike throughout the rest of the story, that of a teacher, deeply concerned to pass on the faith to those who would listen. And the first words out of his mouth, the first teaching he gives, the first words are words of blessing. Blessings on those you would least expect. Blessings that seem oddly unreal in a world run by the powerful and the mighty. Blessed are the peacemakers. Huh, as though that was true in a violent world that doesn't have the faintest idea how to make peace. A world where the Roman Empire was oppressing essentially the whole known world and would continue to do so for another half a millennium. Blessed are the poor in spirit as though the poor had anything to be happy about. Lacking food, lacking shelter, lacking opportunity, lacking education. What, what's so blessed about that? Blessed are those who mourn. Really? Since when is losing a loved one a blessing? Tell that to the recent widow who just lost her husband and now faces a life without her spouse and an uncertain future. Blessed are the, the meek. Really, the meek? I mean, what kind of a word is that even? Who says meek anymore? <laughs> the meek, whoever they are, aren't blessed in Jesus' world or in our own. The meek are ignored and pushed aside and trampled on. Truth be told, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and those blessings he proclaims, which we call the Beatitudes, well, those blessings just sound like they couldn't possibly be true, and our world just doesn't reflect any of what Jesus has to say to us today. 
There is, in my humble opinion, a major disconnect between Jesus and his pronounced blessings and the world that we know today. And I dare say it wasn't any different for the ancients in the first century because their world was every bit as violent and confusing and peaceless as ours. So the, the Beatitudes, if they are supposed to make any sense whatsoever, well, I think they need a lot of unpacking. Part of the problem, I think, is that we in the church for so long looked at those blessings and we kind of, we kind of treated them almost like commandments, right? When, when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, we read this to say that we, the followers of Jesus, are commanded now to make peace. Blessed are the meek, and, and we read it as though Jesus is commanding us to be meek. Blessed are the merciful, right? So if we want to be serious about our faith, we are commanded to show mercy to others, whether they deserve it or not. Th those are blessings as behaviors that we are to exhibit if we want God to love us. Blessings as commandments, as preconditions for God's love. This understanding turns what God intends as blessings into law. And, and to be honest, maybe that's not so far-fetched because the parallels here are quite strong. Parallels between Jesus announcing these so-called blessings and Moses coming down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, with the law. See, Matthew writes for an early Christian community that is still very much part of Judaism, that is very Jewish. And so for Matthew, it's, it's super important that Jesus be seen as the Jewish Messiah, right? As the new Moses. That, that Jesus be seen as someone who comes to fulfill the old law that Moses brought and usher in the new kingdom. Like Moses, Jesus goes up on a mountain, right? And then he comes down and proclaims the beatitude as, as sort of the new law, just as Moses came down the mountain with those tablets. <laughs> In Matthew, the parallels between Moses and Jesus are striking, and intentionally so. New Testament scholar Eric Barreto, he teaches at Princeton Theological Seminary, he said it this way, quote, Matthew's Jesus mirrors Moses in important ways. Like during the time of Moses, Israel suffers under an oppressive ruler. Like Moses, Jesus' life is threatened in its earliest days. Like Moses, Jesus and his family have to flee the threat of death. Like Moses, Jesus too emerges out of Egypt to follow God's call to liberate the people. Like Moses, Jesus wanders in the wilderness and relies on God for sustenance. And here in this part, Beretta goes on to say, Jesus goes up on a mountain, just like Moses went up on Mount Sinai and came back down with the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Are you with me so far? Yeah, this is important. Are you with me? <laughs> say yes. yes. Okay, you're, you're awake. That's good. You, you can see, can't you, that there's a definite connection here. So, so that the idea of the Beatitudes functioning kind of like a, like a law, like the Ten Commandments, isn't so far-fetched, right? Except, <laughs> except it doesn't work that way. We know that God's love is unconditional. We know that there isn't a thing we have to do. Actually, there isn't a thing that we can do in order to somehow earn God's love. Martin Luther understood this more than most. Even the Ten Commandments, which are clearly meant as law to tell us what to do, even the Ten Commandments, Luther says, drive us to the grace and mercy of God because there is no way that we could ever live up to God's expectations in a million years. See, if it was up to us to keep the law, we'd be entirely lost because by nature we are sinful human beings and cannot of our own accord ever meet the standards that God has set in the law. So it is only by the grace of God that we have any chance to make things right between God and amongst each other. See, see the Beatitudes, those blessings that Jesus pronounces on us today, they work in the same way. 
Rather than commandments telling us what to do and how to live, they really emphasize that God has already acted and that, that it is God who declares us blessed despite our wretchedness. And that as a consequence of being blessed in the first place, the best thing we now can do is to share those blessings with all around us. That's why they are called Beatitudes. I looked it up in the dictionary. A Beatitude, it comes from the Latin, or a Macarism, which is based on the Greek word, is a statement in the indicative mood beginning with the format of the adjective blessed, declaring certain people to be in a privileged or fortunate circumstance. The Beatitudes are a teaching of Jesus that proclaims blessings on those you would least expect to receive any. Blessed are the poor, he says, even the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the weak. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus proclaims blessings on those you would least expect that they would consider themselves blessed. And those blessings are in the indicative, right? In the present. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. So you can see that these blessings do not depend on what we do. They are now here because God wants us to be blessed. And we are already blessed because God loves us even in our imperfections. God loves us now in the present. <laughs> but Jesus also proclaims future blessings. For theirs is the kingdom of God. For they will be comforted. For they will inherit the earth. For they will be filled. For they will see God. Blessings in the here and now and blessings to come. Turn to your neighbor, say to your neighbor, you are blessed now, you will be blessed in the future. See, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that it is precisely the poor and the downtrodden and those who are suffering who are blessed now and who will be blessed in the future. Not the high and mighty not the rich and powerful, not the politically well-connected and those who have the inside track, not the religious elite in the temple or the underlings of the emperor in the palace. No, no. Jesus turns all of that around on its head. He turns it upside down and inside out and he proclaims that God's special blessings belong to those who seemingly least deserve it. Can I have an amen? Amen. 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 Jesus is turning our expectations on their head. He's turning them upside down in a, in a very radical and revolutionary way. And that, my friends, is good news for us too. Whatever your circumstances in life, whatever your shortcomings and your fears and your challenges, Jesus assures you today that God's love, God's blessing is for you now and in the future. All we have to do to make our broken world a better place is to share those blessings. So today, <laughs> beloved siblings, I want to challenge you to become butterflies. Spread those wings of yours. Flap those wings so that as you share those blessings that you have received from God with others, that small act of kindness would change the world. The smallest act of kindness that you show to family, neighbors, and friends. The smallest deed of mercy that you show to strangers. The smallest seemingly insignificant sign of love and grace you share even with those you don't like and don't get along with well, maybe especially the ones you don't like and don't get along with, the smallest and most random act of kindness is like the flap of a butterfly wing that will have tremendous consequences in making the world a better place. God is turning our lives around, giving us hope in these troubled times when there is so much 
divisiveness, so much disagreement, so much outright hostility in our political process, so much violence, so much brokenness. The Beatitudes teach us that we all belong together for better or for worse. That we all share one world and, and the abundant blessings that God provides for all. That we all influence each other's way, lives in small ways and in big ways every day. We truly are one community, beloved by God and blessed abundantly. And all we do and say determines whether we can become the beloved community that Dr. Martin Luther King preached about. He said it best when he said, we are tied together in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. Had he known about the butterfly effect? I'm sure Dr. King would have added that the smallest deed of kindness can make a significant difference as we build the beloved community. So I want you to be butterflies. <coughs> Do those little things that will make a huge difference in our world. You know, there's an African-American spiritual that expresses our hope for a better world and our role in bringing light and healing to the dysfunction around us. It's called this little light of mine. This most significant act of kindness, that's the little light. And it can change the world and turn our fear and our despair into peace and joy. God blesses us abundantly even in hard times and God calls us to share this abundance so that blessed by God, we become a blessing to others. Turn to your neighbor again, this time say, you're a blessing to others. So, people of God, as we say when we baptize, you know, a child or an adult, we give them a lighted candle and we say, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's our challenge for today. And in other words, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine.